Okay, thanks for the introduction. As Mark said, this is a joint work with Dario Catalano, Dario Fiore, and it's about programmable hash function. Let me briefly explain the motivation. The motivation is the wide use of random oracle modeling security proofs. What random oracle is? Random oracle is an abstraction which is typically used to as an ideal replacement for cryptographic hash function because of its properties. And the properties are basically two. The first one is random oracle model allows to program the output of an hash function in order to ease simulation. And the second one is that in a random oracle model, the output of hash function can be considered as, as random strings. The bad point is that this is an heuristic model, and so random oracles does not exist in the reality. And the main uh, question that we ask ourselves in this work is, can we obtain random oracle-like properties in the standard model? So actually, a partial answer to this question was given by Offens and Kiltz in 2008 for hash function which maps suitable inputs in a group G, and this kind of function has this kind of, pro of properties which are an indistinguishability property between a standard mode construction where the hash hash is an input into a group G, and the trapdoor mode construction where given two user-specified um, generators of the group, the trapdoor generation algorithm outputs two coefficients A and B, such that H of X can be written like G to the A times H to the B. In addition, we have a well-distributed logarithm property which quite intuitively says that if we take two sets of inputs which are disjoint, the probability that in the trapdoor mode construction, the first set has a representation without a factor G, while the second set has a representation with a factor G, is greater than one over poly. If we want to clarify this concept via a picture, we can say that if we consider the input set, and if we consider two disjoint set of inputs, as I told you before, the um, trapdoor mode representation basically partition the input set with respect to the AI, which actually is a partitioning with respect to the factor, to the presence of the factor G uh, on the trapdoor representation. So basically, the event we are interest, interested in is the event where the first set falls in one set of the partition, while the other one set uh, falls in the other set. And in PHFs, the probability of this good event must be significant. So which is, what is our contribution? Basically, we refine this programmable hash function definition, coming up with the new tool which is called asymmetric programmable hash function, which has some similarity and some difference with the previous one. First of all, the main differences are that uh, the, this asymmetric programmable hash function are secretly computable, and it will be really useful in the following of the talk. They have this programmability notion which is quite similar to the, um, programmable hash, to the previous programmable hash function, and in addition, we have a completely new property which is called programmable pseudorandomness, which will be really useful in simulation in what will follow. And for, the, for what regards application, we have application to linear homomorphic signatures and to standard signatures where basically we get schemes with shorter public keys or with schemes that get the state of the art. So let me introduce this new tool, uh, the asymmetric group hash function. First of all, they are defined over bilinear groups. So basically we have a map from G1 times G2 to GT and uh, an, hash, an asymmetric hash function, an asymmetric group hash function consists in three algorithms, a, a key generation algorithm, which given a security parameter and a bilinear group description outputs a couple of uh, secret key and public key, a private evaluation algorithm, which given an input and a secret key, gives an output, uh, an output of the function, which is secret, so cannot be computed with just the public key, but in addition, we have this public evaluation algorithm which allows everyone who gets the public key to basically compute an homomorphic copy of the output of the function in the target group GT. Moreover, we have these two trapdoor algorithm, a trapdoor generation algorithm and a trapdoor evaluation algorithm where the trapdoor generation takes the security parameter, the bilinear group description, two generators of the first group where the two, which are namely G1 and H1 equal, equals to G1 to the Y1, and two generator, generators of the second group, which are G2 and H2 equals to G2 to the Y2, and output the trapdoor information and the public key. 
while a trapdoor, the trapdoor evaluation algorithm taking the trapdoor and an input gives in output the description of a degree D um, polynomial in the variables y1 and y2, which are the discrete logarithms of h1 and h2, which is of the degree D. And the trapdoor evaluation algorithm is such that h of x can be written like g1 to the cx of y1 and y2. So let's, let me introduce the concept of programmability, which, as I told you before, is quite similar to, to the, the one relative to the programmable hash function introduced by Offitz and, Klit, and Kiltz. Uh, we say that an hash function is m and, delta gamma de, m and d gamma delta programmable if there exists uh, a trapdoor generation and a trapdoor evaluation algorithm such that correctness holds, and we saw it in the previous slide, such that we have statistical closed trapdoor keys, which means that a, key, a public key, which is output of the standard mode generation, key generation algorithm, and a public key, which is output of the trapdoor generation algorithm, have a statistical distance, which is, ga which is gamma. And then we have a well-distributed logarithm, which is a property which is quite similar to the one before. So if we have two different set, subsets of inputs, uh, which are disjoint, the probability that CXI0 uh, is 0 and CZJ0 is different from 0 is greater or equal than delta, where with CXI0, we mean the degree 0 term of the polynomial output of the trap uh, evaluation algorithm. In addition, we have this completely new property, which is the programmable pseudorandomness property, and we model the definition via an experiment between and an adversary and the challenger. So basically, after giving the challenger to generator, a generator of G1 and a generator of G2, the adversary is, is uh, able to perform some queries, and he gets back the output of a function over the input and a value TB, which can be either G1 to the CX0, where CX0 is, again, the degree zero coefficient of the polynomial CX, or a random element in, in G1. And we say that H has programmable pseudorandomness if basically, really intuitively, uh, the, um, the adversary is not able to distinguish between the word one and word uh, zero with a probability which is not negligible. So let me stress out that these two properties are basically mutually, mutually exclusive. So we can get uh, programmability or programmable pseudorandomness, and the reason is quite intuitive. So if we have programmability from definition, we have that CX0 is equal to zero with non-negligible probability, and in this way we can basically trivially break the pseudorandomness experiment. So what about our contribution? Uh, first of all, we have this linearly homomorphic signature scheme with shorter public keys. And basically, before giving you an intuition of our result, I will recall some notion about homomorphic signature. So what homomorphic signature are? They were introduced by Johnson et al. in 2002. And so far, we have uh, homomorphic signatures for linear function over vector spaces, for polynomials, and for circuits of bounded polynomial depth. And we can prove security either in random oracle model or in the standard model, as you can see from the double color. So how it works. We have two users, which are Alice and Bob. Alice has some messages that she wants to outsource to a server. And so to do that, she signs every message, and she gives the couple's message signature to the server. And Bob is allowed to perform some computation or some function over that data, but he doesn't have either the computational or the storage capacity to do that. So basically what he does is sending the function as an, an identifier of Alice's data to the server. The server computes the function and gives back Bob the, the result of the function and the signature which uh, holds for, for that result. Then. Bob can locally uh, run a verification algorithm and decide if accept or reject the result from the server. A bit more formally, we can say that a homomorphic signature scheme consists of a tuple of algorithms. A key generation algorithm, with, in this simplification, takes 
the security parameter and the indexes of the messages in the data set and gives back a public key and a secret key, a signing algorithm with, with the index, um, the message and the secret key gives in output a fresh signature, an evaluation algorithm which uses the public key and as a function and a bunch of fresh signatures and gives in output a signature for the output of the function and the, and the verification key and a verification algorithm which basically verify that the signature belongs to the result of, of the function f or not. Basically, we have this correctness property for what if we have some fresh signatures and we perform the evaluation algorithm over this fresh signature and over um, the function f using the, the public key, the verification algorithm with the result of the evaluation algorithm has to, to be one. And for what regards security, roughly speaking, we can say that an adversary without Alice's secret key cannot produce a valid signature for false results. So which is the state of the art? If we look at the size of the public key, we see that in the random oracle model, the public key is like custom size, while in the standard model, all the existing schemes which are proven secure as a public key which is linear in the size of the data set. And basically, from one, on one end, this is not meaningless because you can amortize such a cost of storing uh, such a large public key, reusing it for, massive, for, for multiple data set, but on the negative side, basically, uh, a user Bob cannot be able to store such a large, uh, larger key. So what we ask ourselves is, can we achieve a standard model signature scheme with a key which has length which is sublinear in N? So our contribution is, we came up with the first standard model homomorphic signature scheme with sublinear public key, which is linearly homomorphic for data set of dimension N and with elements which are vectors of dimension T, with public key which is linear in square root of N plus square root of T, and which is built using a generically homomorphic, uh, um, uh, using generically asymmetric programmable hash function and the property of pseudo-randomness. The assumption we did are the two Diffie-Elman inversion assumption, a new constant size assumption we came up with, with which is called flexible Diffie-Elman assumption, and the programmable pseudo-randomness of APHFs, which in our case it's proven with external DDH. Moreover, we have this efficient verification procedure for which we can split the verification algorithm in two phases, one offline and one, on, and one online, in order to uh, augment the efficiency of the verification online phase. I have no time to go in the details of our scheme, so what I'm going to do is to give uh, you an intuition of what we did via a toy example, uh, which works for random messages and for a single data set. The key generation algorithm takes the security parameter and the indexes of the messages in the data set and outputs a verification key, which basically is the verification key of the hash function along with an element g2 to the z, while the secret key is the secret key of the underlying hash function again, and with an along with an element z taken at random in zp. The signing algorithm works taking at random ri and g1, and evaluating as i, which is h of i times r i to the one over z. And basically, we have a two element signature formed by s i and r i. And when we have to perform the evaluation algorithm, if the description of the linear function is via its coefficient f1, fn, fl, we have that the signature, the resulting signature is the product of s i to the f i and the product of the r i to the f i. While the verification equation is what you can read here. And the key point is that we have this public evaluation algorithm which allows any user with the public key to evaluate basically the verification equation. So the signature is linearly homomorphic. If we multiply SI and SJ, we have a signature for RI times RJ. And now the point is how can we prove security? So, we are going to use a simplification of flexible Diffie-Hellman inversion. Uh, and this assumption says that if an adversary is given G1, G2, and G2 to the Z, it's hard for him to find a couple of elements in G1, which are W and W to the 1 over Z, where W has to be different from 1. So first observation. 
the fact that H is secretly computable is necessary. Uh, if not, you can take R star as H to the I to the minus one and basically break the scheme. But I mean, what does it mean proving security? Proving security means build a simulation such that it's possible for him to simulate signatures and given a forgery of the signature scheme, the simulator can use it to break the security assumption. So first of all, if we have B, such that it can simulate signatures, it's easy to break the scheme, to, to break the assumption, sorry. Why? Because if A came up with a forgery as, as, R, 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 as star R star, where this is a forgery for an index I star such that S R was a previously, a pre, a, the, the answer of a, previously, a, of a previous question over the, the index I star, we can take S star over S and R, R star over R and break the security assumption. Why? Because S star over S is basically R star over R to the one over Z because of this equation. And since R star is a forgery, it must be R star different from R. And so R star over R is different from one. So basically what is left? The challenge we have now is how to simulate signatures without having G1 to the Z. And what we do is we use the trapdoor generation algorithm of our hash function for D equals one with H1 equals one and H2 equals two, G2 to the Z. So we model this, so this proof with three games. Game zero is basically, uh, is basically the, the, normal, the, normal signing, the normal signing. So we have H of i times Ri to the one over z and Ri taken at random in G1. In, G, in, G1. Uh, in the game one, we replace the, um, the hash function with the, the, trap the, the output of the trap to representation and we still have Ri taken at random in G1, and in game two, we, we replace Ri with G1 to the minus Ci0. So, Si equals to G1 to the Ci1 is a valid signature for Ri since it verifies the verification equation, and basically, for what regards the analysis, Game one and game zero are indistinguishable because of the indistinguishability of the standard and the trapdoor generation of the hash function, while game one and game two are indistinguishable because of the programmable pseudo-randomness of H, which basically says that this element looks random to a PPT adversary. So in conclusion, what we did is refining the programmable hash function, coming up with asymmetric programmable hash functions. The main difference, as I told you before, are that they are secretly computable. They have a programmability notion which is similar to PHS but has some differences, and has this new property which is called programmable pseudo-randomness. For what regards application, what I have already shown to you is uh, the first standard model homomorphic signature scheme with a sublinear public key, which is linearly homomorphic, with data set of n elements and with elements which are vectors of dimension t. They are built using APHFs with programmable pseudorandomness and using our construction that you can find in the paper, HSQRT, uh, we have um, that the, si the length of the, the public key is uh, linear in square root of n plus square root of t. And more concretely, if we have n which is equal to 10 to the 6, and with 128 bits of security. Previous solution required uh, public key length greater than 32 megabytes, while our solution allows for uh, a, pub a verification key which is just 100 kilobytes. For what regards standard signatures, plugging our construction of asymmetric programmable function, we basically match the state of the art as Yamada et al. in 2012. So that's the end of the talk, and thank you for the attention.